Hey guys, I just want to say happy birthday to one of our really good friends, Brienne. She is the narrator and the creator of the Among the Dirt and Trees podcast, a true crime podcast that occurs out in nature. So be sure to go tell her happy birthday. Also, for you Hamilton fans out there, one of her latest episodes was on the whereabouts of Dear Theodosia. It's an extremely interesting case. So happy birthday, Brienne. Hey Tacos, tonight we're taking a final look into the George Steiny Jr. case to see whether or not he should be fully exonerated by the state of South Carolina. It's important to note that the time period in which he was tried and convicted was so different than of today's in many ways. And because of this, we must view this case through the lens of history and not hate, learning from and correcting our mistakes instead of dwelling on them. Also, let's not forget about the victims Binnaker and Tims and their families who still live with this awful tragedy. Welcome to part two of our George Steiny Jr. episode. If you did not listen to the first part of this episode, we talked about the case of George Steiny Jr., who was convicted of murdering uh, two young girls back in March of 1944 in Alkulu, South Carolina. And it was a very sad case, not just for the victims, but also because George Steiny Jr. was the youngest person to ever receive mm. the death penalty via the electric chair in the United States. And recently, uh, as recent as seven years ago, his Younger sister Amy came out and tried to have George exonerated, saying that she was with him the whole day uh, and he did not commit the crime. So we are going to examine whether or not George did indeed commit the crime and if he had a fair trial. So that is what our discussion is going to center around tonight. And we're just glad that you guys joined us back or tuning in for the first time and um, we hope you enjoy it. So with further, no further ado, John. It's quite the intro, Jen. Nice Thank job. You. Thank you. Welcome. All right. <laughs> Recording now. Go ahead. I hear you. I can punch you <laughs> in the throat. <laughs> uh... So the case was reopened on January 21st, 2014. A lot of people think that he had nothing to do with it. In fact, the the worst mistake he's ever made in his life was saying, hey, I was I saw those girls earlier today. Okay, think about that. The worst mistake he's ever made. It's hard, though, because he, he did confess, but his story changed. It's just it's just well, hard when you think about well you can't open and you can't open an old case unless there's new evidence. Tr true. So was there new evidence? That's a good point. Here's the thing. A lot of the evidence is gone and lost to history. Completely lost to history. Mm. But and you have to ask yourself why was it lost to history? This is Amy Ruffner, you're looking at right now, I'll put this these photos on talkmer.com. This was from the 2014 trial. This was George Steiny Jr.'s shadow. Eight years old at the time, younger sister, mm. has just now came out and said, I was with him the entire day. And you don't forget a day like that. You don't forget a day your brother is hauled off by cops and you never see him again. And then you see him... Chris Blue, you know, 83 days, 83 days later, mm -hmm. you don't forget that day. So you have the sister, which was eight years old, saying, I was there. I was with him the entire day. He did not do this. The way you just framed that made me think of uh, the first season of the serial podcast, how they opened it was like, do you remember what you did two weeks ago on Tuesday? <laughs> Unless, and it's like, and yeah. it talks about, like, just asks you on a specific day, like, where were you? What did you do? And unless something significant happened that day, you can't remember, like, what, what yeah. it was. So it's really, like, and that just, I remember that opening little sequence yeah. pulled me into that podcast. 70, 70 years ago, go by, 
And now finally, 80 something year old sister says, hey, I was with them. He didn't do that. They actually and in the, the legal terms of this case is fascinating. If you're into law, you would love this case. Usually in South Carolina, if they want to exonerate someone, mm-hmm. and I don't know about other states, I just looked it up for this, they would bring what is called a South Carolina Rule of Criminal Procedure, Form 29B. Okay. This says, hey, based on the evidence, the new evidence, because there's got to be new evidence and it's got to be filed within a year. So there's new evidence, which was the sister's testimony. Okay, that counts as evidence. But it wasn't within a year. Or the, no, it has no. to be she brought- came out last year and said she was with her. So, okay, she just so it doesn't have out. to be within the year. Oh, not not last event. year, you know, 2013. Okay, so it has to be a, a uh, year yeah, within yeah. the so new evidence. If she would have okay. came out and now now they couldn't open it. Okay. They had to open the case a within year. a year okay. of the new ev- evidence being presented. Thanks. Got yeah. it. But they can only use that, that 29B form if they can compare that new evidence to the old evidence. But guess what? They don't have a murder weapon. They don't even have the confession. Okay? They don't have the written confession where he signed. They don't have anything. Literally, there's like five pieces of paper on this case. Are, there's nothing. Like, was there so, really a written confession that he signed on? Well, no one knows. But you have the deputy, his <sighs> his statement. But they went in with the... With the premise that there's, I mean, number one, the only, this case, there's only a defense for George Steiny because the family of the two victims, they've died. And really recently, in fact, within two, three years, the last one that could stand up and say, my daughter, you know, yada, 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 or my sister you know, was murdered by him. They're dead. So now you have new evidence brought by not just Amy Rufner, the sister, the younger sister, but also the older sister who says she wasn't there at the time she was in the house washing dishes, but she did see the girls pass by. And then she saw George afterward. He had no blood on his clothes and stuff like that. So you have two witnesses, even though they're sisters, providing testimony, but you have no, no, no one... On the other side, if that makes sense. And there's no murder weapon. There's no evidence. There's no confession. So there's in no order, bloody clothes that so, were buried in the yard. So it's, it's going to be difficult to find someone like him innocent. It feels very hearsay. Yeah. Okay. So that that's why this case. years later. That's why this case is so important. And I'm so sick of seeing all this media, you know, yada, yada, yada. You got to dive in and do, you know, because you got to set the record straight. You know what I'm saying? So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. Anyway, before we get done, I want you guys to decide to yourselves whether, number one, he did it or not, and number two, whether he got a fair trial. And those are two different things. Yes. Completely. I mean, he he should be innocent if they can't prove him guilty, but that doesn't mean he's innocent of Of killing the two girls. Again, very harkens to some of the most popular cases in recent history. Yeah. But on, like I said, January 21st, the case was reopened using a, a centuries old technique. They couldn't use the one because there's no evidence. There's no nothing. Right. Nothing. So they use a centuries old technique, a law instrument called the writ of quorum nobis, which literally translates into in the Latin word, quote, the errors before us, end quote. So didn't they use that in um, they tried to use that in Avery's case, didn't they? Or was it the staircase one? That no, I doubt that's they use a it. different writ. Yeah, because you would use you would want to overturn the conviction. They can't do they can't overturn the conviction here. What they're trying to do with this writ is saying it translates to the heirs before us. They are trying to rewrite the sentence and say that there's errors here. There's errors in the the police reports that were filed and we need to to fix the errors. Oh, I was thinking of um habeas corpus. Is that the one where the 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 lawyers were not Yeah, habeas corpus is what you're thinking of. That's the usual one they use. Okay. But that's usually if they have the person. So Stephen Avery and that means 
Something that's what, that, I th- that's what I think Brendan Dassey was granted, it translates, but then, like, uh, ultimately it didn't. It translates to something like uh, to bring the body in front of us or something. So not not dead body, but to bring body the person. Proof, yeah. So the person's got to be oh. still available. You know, this is this guy's been dead for 20, 70 years. Oh, okay. This is going to be really tough to overturn because the attorneys, they have, they have to prove, the number one thing is that he had an unfair trial. How many days before he got executed? 83. There you go. So we're going to dive a in. Quick, that's quick. Yeah. That's extremely quick. We're, but but did he receive a fair trial? Because as the judge says, they're not just all racist and, and stuff like that because she can't see another judge being like that. But the rules are different back then. We're living in the Jim Crow era. That's completely different rules than what we have now. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they were doing something wrong. They were just abiding by different rules. Does that make sense? They had, yeah, totally different perception. Yeah, that's why I want to bring in this case. However, there's really no records on this case. The murder weapon is in what they call a fluid, okay, which means they don't even know what it is. The autopsy reports is a hammer, as y'all read, but it also points to a railroad spike. And, Which and they the police, supposedly pulled out of the mud. The police said it was an iron rod. That's what the police report said. So there's three different claims on the murder weapon right there. So that's why they do this, the writ of quorum novus. Anyway, moving on. Let's move on with this thing. Sorry. So this is what Amy Ruffner says. Quote, my name is Amy L. Ruffner. My maiden name was Amy L. Steiny. I was born in Pinewood, South Carolina. When I was about four years old, my family moved to Alkulu. Now, she was the sister at the time she was eight years old when this happened. Not only does she say that her older brother was innocent, but she also says he was she was with him the entire day as his shadow. He followed her around everywhere. The first question we need to answer is why now? Why in 2014? Yeah. Did you do you come now after all the other family are dead that they can't stick up for their story and tell their side of the story. Why in 2014 do you want to come and clear your brother's name? Why? Like, I mean, this happened in 1944, okay? When was the Civil Rights enacted? 1964. You couldn't have done it then? Okay, what about the 70s? What about the 80s? The NAACP was formed in 1909. They could have helped you. Why in 2014 are you bringing it now? Any idea i don't know why but that was one of my questions you know i understand it with it being oh that's for- a big question well, yeah i mean i understand it with with it being the 40s maybe not something yeah. you could have done quite then but after the civil rights 2000 i mean i know? mean yeah even the the 70s 80s uh-huh. um when it's obviously it's still a couple decades after it happened but but you know it's a good question do you know do we know why yeah i know why Tell us what this is, since you said it. uh, Plessy Plessy versus versus Ferguson. Ferguson. The site of the arrest of Homer Adolf Plessy. 1865, April 9th, end of the Civil War. That brings us out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then comes the era of what? You know, starts with an R, Reconstruction. Yeah. Civil War completely decimated our economy, both North and South, completely destroyed. We fought ourselves. I mean, what the hell? Yeah. So Reconstruction is us coming back together and trying to build up what we literally tore down to the ground. That's the era of Reconstruction. 1890, even though there were 16 black members on the Louisiana General Assembly, a law was passed that prevented blacks from riding together on railroads with whites, right? 1896, courts decided that we're separate oh the separate, separate but equal but equal okay so now you guys know what the, that's it yep. yeah separate but equal two years later the white population started limiting votes uh voting rights for the black people an example 1896 before the separate but equal came about there were 130,334 registered black voters Eight years later, there were 1,342. Okay. You went from 130,000 to 1,000. This brings us into the Jim Crow era. Now, Jim Crow is a derisive term used for an African-American man, right? The Civil War Reconstruction era, but down here in the South, the Reconstruction means that blacks and whites are separate but equal, which also means that black people can get jobs 
that white people are supposed to have from what they're thinking. So now they're going to take our jobs. Hey, that's not cool. You know, I don't want, yeah, we're separate but equal, but there's only so many jobs to go around type of thing. That's the Jim Crow era. Racism fueled the fear that the white population would lose job opportunities. The main employee in Alcala, in Alcula, was the lumber mill. Right. Right. Right after the murders, every I mean, everyone worked there, white and black. And how, how you have it was, a lot of towns were separated by train tracks. Blacks one side, whites the other side. We're all equal, but we just don't really interact. We're the people. wrong side of the tracks. Kind of exactly. Yeah. I couldn't find that there were, I mean, there were tracks that go straight to the lumber mill, but I don't think it was separated by one side or the other. But however, it was definitely separated. Mm -hmm. Everyone worked at the lumber mill. That was where everyone worked, whites and blacks. There were also black churches, white churches. You mm -hmm. went to your church, they went to their church. Schools, black schools, white schools. You went to your church, they went to their church. Same with communities. You went to their church. You definitely didn't go pick Maypops in the black community. Well, they did cross that line because they're freaking kids. They don't see color. That's adults that have these problems, right? These kids, they, I mean, they, they play, the kids are playing with each other, white and black, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the adults that are fucked, yeah. fucked in the head, right? This is from the defense attorney, if you want to read this, from the 2014 argument. The night of George Steiny's arrest, the entire Steiny family was forced to leave town on foot in the middle of the night by what were later described as lynch mobs. Oof. Okay. Oh, so man. let me go back to why it took you so long, 2013, to to say that you were with them. They arrest your brother, George Steiny Jr., 14 years old. And they actually arrest his older brother, too, Johnny, his stepbrother. They actually take Johnny, they drop him a few, they take him all the way to police station, but only and drop him a few miles away from home. He's got to walk back. They drop him even further than where he was. So he's walking back. His little stepbrother, George Steiny Jr., is in the interrogation room without a parent or anything, confessing all this stuff. Okay. Which not only that. Technically would not be allowed, but. Oh, right, there you go. Yeah. That, so we're forming opinions here. Not only that, but. You, George Steiny Jr. confessed. He's he's in the, you're never gonna see him again. However, your dad comes home working in a lumber mill all day. Says, "Hey, we gotta pack up and move tonight under the cover of darkness because if not, we're gonna get lynched." He was fired from his job that day, and they had to move. They left their cow Lizzie, which he, she's gonna be important. Aww. She was picked up by someone else. She's fine. Not to, she's dead obviously today, but she is fine anyway. And I want to bring up a, a unrelated thing. Some I can't remember who did this, but uh, someone left a comment that said, uh, "You know, remember every time we're like, I want the dog made alive." Someone left a good comment that said, every time I, I want to know that question, I go to this website. It's like, uh, did the dog die or something dot com. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and it has like the answer to those questions. Wow, there, it's that like is a, awesome. It's like a Wikipedia thing. I'm sorry I can't shout your name out. I can't think of it right there now. There you go. That's cool to know. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, under the cover of darkness, they pack up everything. Their whole life, they pack up. Now, in their mind... What are they going to do, okay, with George? He's done. You can't, They can't do anything, right, at all for the guy. He was tried by his peers, which was legal, uh, 12 white jurors, and 10, 10 minutes they decided that he would was be put to death. But they did do the medical examination, confession. He did find a murder weapon, stuff like that. I'm not saying he's innocent. I just want to tell you all the facts. All right. Do you say 10 minutes? They yeah, it took him 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. This case is really important to me because, I mean, you guys aren't from here, but you know what is, what is South Carolina? We got Dylan Roof right down the street, right? I, we, let's get, we can get in a, a car right now, 10 minutes we're at the old market where Africans used to come over on ships and be sold. Okay. So the the way the judge put it, it's not if, because this was a times back then, 
Okay. It's not if South Carolina was wrong or, or we did something, uh, you know, um, egregious or whatever. Is that the right word? Egregious? Yeah, that, that could be used there. But yeah. there is a stain on South Carolina's history. And if there is a stain, meaning he didn't do it, or if he didn't get a fair trial, we need to try to remove the stain. It's, you know what I'm saying? That is the goal of this case. And that is why this case is extremely important to me, because I grew up here and we're known for we're known for this stuff, man. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, this, it's a dark it history. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still happening, too, you know? Yeah. Just saying. My brother George's job was to take the cow out to graze after school. And I always went with him. He called me a shadow. One day after school, while my brother and I were sitting on the tracks, while the cow was grazed, we saw two white girls pushing their bicycle. When they got closer to where they were stopped and asked us, did we know where they could find some May Pops? We said no, and they went on about their business. It was strange to see them in our area because white people stayed on their side of Alkaloo, and we knew our place. After they left... We saw Mrs. Daisy looking out of her window, so we waved to her and left the cow to, and left to take the cow home. At home, I ran the water in the tub. The cow finished drinking water. My brother put the cow in the shed, and we went in the house to eat and started our schoolwork. Yeah, so that is what she's bringing forth. So the, the goal of this episode is to try to see if she is accurate about that, because it is 70 years ago. You can't tell me an eight-year-old will remember so specifically 70 years ago. So you want to reverse a conviction based on a memory that is 70 years old because she is the only one that can prove him innocent. It's her and her testimony. That's what I'm trying to say. Because they don't find another killer, okay? It's either he if he did it or didn't, and we got to decide... Stuff like what we're going to talk about, go back to the the wounds. Those are pretty powerful wounds. Yes. You know, stuff like that. Like, can a 95-pound 14-year-old deliver those types of wounds? Where would he even get a hammer or a murder weapon? He's not bringing that crap around with him. He would have to just find it. A railroad spike is not something that is light either. Exactly. Plus, there's no drag marks. Did he carry both the girls over there how would he even do this because his family his mom's so strict his only job his only chore when he gets home from school is to let the cow graze and that's within seeing distance of the house so when would he have time to do this you know what i'm saying plus as we'll talk about he admits that he didn't do it and that he he just told them what they wanted to hear because they they made him tell them what they want to what, what they want to hear type of thing mm-hmm. and he is kind of sad actually if he did not do it his cellmate at the time his name was Johnny which is not related to the other Johnny his cellmate was reading a magazine and he's already got his death sentence George Stein Jr's got his death sentence he was reading a magazine and a page said uh, something like um, what what's your future going to be? It's like one of those kind of make whoever you want to be. And then George Steiny Jr. looks over and says, gee, I, I don't have a future. Oh, my God. So that's pretty bad. It's it's so I, anyway, it's not to I don't know. That's what I want to talk about in this episode. We're going to lay out everything and we're going to make a decision whether he did it or whether he didn't do it and whether he got a fair trial. You know, because just because there's 12 white people on the jury does not mean it's an unfair trial. Okay. Right. That, I mean, we got to go back and see if they've done everything right. For instance, the medical examiner was also with a family practitioner, like no training whatsoever. Should that have been allowed type of thing? So that's what they're trying to do with this writ. They're trying to correct the errors and if the errors are substantial enough, they can actually exonerate him. Not They're not going to say if he's innocent or guilty, but they're going to say that w- we made a mistake type of thing, you know. First, I want to talk about the book we're reading from. This is Triple Tragedy and Alkulu by Kendall Bell. He's a local South Carolinian, South Carolina historian. So 
a question that popped up to my mind. Uh, you mentioned that George Jr. had an older brother. Yeah, mm. well, uh, he was a half-brother, Johnny. There's a good movie that I haven't actually watched. I watched a little bit of it, but it's called Carolina Skeletons. Ooh. The brother come and it's a fictional movie, but it's based on the story. And the brother, Johnny, I don't know if that's his name in the movie, but he and it was a book before that. He comes back to Al Alcolu and he's served in the army. In fact, he's wearing a special forces tab hmm. and a special forces uh insignia and he's got a green beret on and he is trying to clear his brother's name. If you if you were asking if the brother had anything to do with it, I mean, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, Sorry. I was. That's that was my question is to see if maybe if the brother could have been connected in any way. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But as you'll see, that's most likely not the case. All right. So what you're seeing now is from that movie Carolina Skeletons. Now I can't play it on YouTube, but we'll watch the clip of it. Obviously, is that from the movie? This is from the movie, oh. but it shows him getting oh, executed, mm -mm. and it's 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 terrifying. We don't want to watch it. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, let's move on. <laughs> I'll put the link on talkmurder.com for the video. Oh, God, yeah. And you can at least see how it was, because they didn't... Even stuff like what they would usually do if someone was small, like a small man, they would put books under his butt to li lift him up. And stuff like that. They didn't do anything for this for this kid. So this is what the judge says, Judge Mullen. And I just want to say this. Obviously, she's actually a new judge. And she's the one that is ultimately going to rule whether this should be expunged or not. I've looked at it, and I don't see that there would be any evidence that Frank McLeod, the solicitor at the time, did anything other than what he was supposed to do and sworn to do. As a judge, I find it very hard to believe that another judge sitting in this capacity that had a long learned record and sitting on the bench would do anything improper. I think my focus is more on what the defense attorney did or did not do, possibly to a lack of experience and certainly given the political climate and cultural climate during the time. Yeah, so there there are probably I mean, there are probably a, a lot of racist KKK members, especially there. But th what she's trying to say is not everyone is. And or true. was even if this was a cover up, which you guys will see, it may have been the judge may not even have known about it. You know, the prosecutor or the uh, the defense attorney, he may have been racist. But, you know, at the end of the day, he would never want to see an innocent boy, 14 year old put to death. You know what I'm saying? Just because there's a few bad apples doesn't mean everyone is bad. That's what True. that's what she was trying to say. Well, and the judge really only knows what the prosecution and defense team brings forward, right? What they just like what's disclosed yeah. in the case. Yeah, but the judge. Yeah, exactly. So the judge, if the sheriff says, "Hey, judge, listen, this guy confessed. I found the murder weapon." What's the judge supposed to do? Say you're are you lying about this? Yeah. I mean, you know, he's going to take him as word. And then that's just how it is. Before we get to who done it or did he do it, let's talk about some of the letters that started to pour in begging the governor for clemency or at least for life in prison sentence for George Steiny Jr. Now these are This from is back then, back in the yeah, 40s. Yeah, thousands of letters came in. And remember, a lot of our boys are overseas, and a lot of those boys are white and black mm -hmm. together because we all have to join in for the war effort. Mm -hmm. But thousands of letters came in begging for a clemency, and it was obviously uh, never granted. One of the letters reads from H.L. Bailey, who was a soldier stationed in Europe at the time. I'm going to read this verbatim. It says, quote, I am a white Southern boy. I've been in the army long enough to know what the Negro boys are losing their lives for this country. And I surely think they should have the same treatment as the whites are getting. If not, what in the world are we fighting for? End quote. Mm -hmm. And if you've, if you've ever been in the armed services, you learn really quick that you're not going, you can't be racist because you have all kinds of colors uh, serving by you. Another letter from a Sunday school teacher reads the following 
quote, just as sure as this child is electrocuted, this deed will be looked back upon with the shame and remorse in later years by the citizens of South Carolina, and the finger of scorn will be pointed at us by other states, end quote. Now these, it's not just the black population sending these letters. In fact, it's mostly the white population sending these letters because they know a tragedy when they see it. All right, back to the story. George Steiny Jr. was at the house. The younger brother, Charles, which also testified. A younger sister, Amy, which is the one we've been uh, hearing from. She was eight years old. And the older brother, half-brother, excuse me, Johnny, stopped by before leaving for the Army that weekend. George Steiny Jr. and Amy, they returned from school and they started their chores. This family, the Steinies, did not own a vehicle. George Steiny Jr. was supposed to watch over his little sister, and she was considered his, quote, shadow. Okay, around 3.30 p.m., George Steiny and Amy went to take Lizzie the Cow down Green Hill Church Road, the road that you guys saw on Google Earth. They were sitting on the railroad tracks watching Lizzie Grave, Grave, <laughs> Watching Lizzie graze when the girls approached, they said, do you know where we can pick some Maypops? They said no. They were in shock because they never seen two white girls. They never seen them in their life, actually, because this was segregated. They went to their own school. Got it. Even though they were the same age. But they're like in the wrong part of the town, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. The white girls were. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so they told them they didn't know. Now, what you're seeing now on the screen, I'll put all these documents on talkmore.com. This is the actual search, what happened, the documents of, okay, you know, we we searched, we found the bodies, this, that, and the other. And who you're seeing now is Lonnie Randolph Jr. He is one of the family members. He is posing with a Sonia Edie Williamson and at the dedication of George Steiny Jr.'s memorial. This is in Alcolu. The reason I'm showing you this photo is because here is where we take a, a drastic turn with this case. At some point, we know from the words of a, a lady at the time, her name was Amelia Burke. Okay, she was an adult. She was watching her three-year-old grandson at the time we know that somewhere along the way of these girls going to pick may pops they stop by the house that is a fact stop by the steinies house no stop by burke burke's Burke's house house. okay this lady burke's house she's washing the dishes she says i can't go with you guys because i'm watching my three-year-old grandson that would turn out to be the worst mistake she's ever made in her life She has a 26-year-old son who was also at the house. Now, this none of this has been proven, but it's pretty damning if you look at the evidence from what I'm going to present. And the ancestry timeline is kind of hard with this family because they're kind of spread out. This is a wealthy white family that has ties to the lumber mill right there in town. Okay. Okay. Amelia's 26-year-old son, Wayne, was at the house, and the stories kind of differ here. Either he offered the girls a ride in the lumber truck, or or he didn't. However, Amy Rufner, the sister of George Steiny, when they're sitting on the tracks, remember they were there the entire day, when The girls pass by going east. Mm -hmm. After they pass, a lumber truck does pass. And most likely it was Wayne, the 26-year-old son of Amelia Burke. Now, the Burke family is a prominent, white, wealthy family in the area. What we know for a fact is that at some point, the girls stopped by this Amy, or excuse me, stopped by this Amelia Burke's house. She refused to go with them because she's watching her three-year-old grandson. Her own son was a 26-year-old named Wayne Burke. He either took the girls or drove by 
And this, this is 70 years ago, so recollection, you know what I'm saying? But Amy does claim that she saw a lumber truck drive by after the girls left from them. So wouldn't Going it, in the same direction Going as in the, the same direction. So wouldn't it make sense, because she, uh, didn't she say she saw them walking past, that one was one one was on the bike and the other one wasn't? Or is that you saying that one was on the bike and the other one wasn't? One was on the, no, one. they were both pushing the bikes but both pushing the what bike. I want you to say is, and we're going to get to the bike in detail because I don't know if you guys remember, but the wheel was completely detached from the bike. Yes. yes. Okay. It could have been hit by a car, by a truck, by a lumber truck. There's not a lot of traffic on this dirt road. Right. Not any at all. It's all lumber traffic and they did see a lumber truck drive by. So... It could have been that the bike was hit by this lumber truck is what I'm trying to say here. Sonia, the girl in the picture right here, how she's involved in this is her family, her distant relatives is the Burks. Okay. So Mm -hmm. her distant relatives are the Burke family. Okay. And they're also well known to be in the Ku Klux Klan. And she's not happy about that. Okay. And she's actually- She's actually the one of the ones that came forward and said, hey, I've got information about this case and I want to get it solved because this has been on my mind for ever. OK, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It may, I wonder if it was if like that was a detail that her family then like knew and purposefully withheld. Yeah, it, it was. And I'm and this is a quote from a 2018 article from the Post and Courier, which is a huge newspaper down here, Pulitzer Prize prize winner and everything else. This is a direct quote from her. Now, she is the distant relative of the Burks. I know I know. there's a lot of no, it's good. families, but we're trying to get it straight. This mm-hmm. is what she says. Sonia's grandfather had been at the courthouse the day of George Steiny's trial, and he'd seen the boy that morning. He'd watched as George arrived in what he could best describe as a cage. Mm. Police escorted the child inside wearing heavy chains wearing chains so heavy he could barely walk, and an angry crowd had spit on him as he passed. Yet time and time again, Sonia's grandfather had said, I know that colored boy didn't do it. Hmm. But was the grandfather then in, in support of, like, who was okay, the grandfather stay, in support Stay of? with me here. We were at Amelia's house. The, she's the Burke. Right, The, yes. the wife of the George guy. Burke. Yeah. Who has the son Wayne Burke who yeah. was driving a lumber yeah, truck. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You okay. got it. So the elder George Burke yeah. is the or was at the time the company boss of the lumber mill. Oh. Okay. Okay. So basically his son took the lumber truck and was driving it. His twenty six year old son. You okay. guys with me? Yeah. yeah. Kind of okay. like, hey dad, can I borrow the company truck type Yeah, of thing? and yeah. Sonia, these are just her distant relatives. Yep. I know it's really nope, confusing. You're good. You're good. Okay. Now We're going back right now to the search party affidavit. I don't know if you guys can see it, but down there, it says George Burke's name. So he was actually, and his son, Wayne Burke, were the leaders of one of the search parties. They were also the ones who found the bodies. Hmm. Okay. Oh, that was the one who found the body. Well, uh, Scott Loader was the actual one who found the body, but the... The Burks, they led, I don't want to say led, but they the, they were in the vicinity they were of with where that the specific body. It was that yes. search party. Okay, okay. yeah. Okay, I know this is it. hard to understand. No, 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 no you're good. No, we're clear, just clarifying. Okay, good. So they may have had time to put place things where they needed to. Mm-hmm. George Burke Sr., the company mill on, a worker, owner, a company mill boss, is the one that fired. George Steiny's father, that, and not only that, that, same day told him to get out. Get you got to get out of here. George Burke Sr. was the lumber mill company boss. He also served on George Steiny Jr.'s coroner inquest and in the grand jury. Okay, he's the one that found the body and everything. A lot of people think his son Wayne Burke, the one that was driving the truck, did this, killed the girls. And we're, I'm about to show you that that may be the case. After the girls stopped by and asked about the Maypops, like I said, Amy said that she remembers the lumber truck barreling by in the direction of the girls. All right, now let's 
raise things up one more notch. If you want to read this, Nicole. Amy recalled that her father had worked at the mill, and at one point her mother had done domestic work for a prominent white family in town. Their name? Burke. One night, her mother had come home telling their father that a man named George Burke Sr. had made a pass at her. Don't go back there, her father had cautioned. So the mother, George Steiny's mother, gets a pass made on her by a well-recognized womanizer. There's she is multiple assaulted. accounts of let's use the real word. The Burks, she's assaulted. The elder Burke doing this stuff, mm-hmm. and she turns him down. She tells the husband that this has happened, and he's like, "Don't ever go back there." Soon after that, this scenario happens. Wayne Burke actually dies three years later of a chronic kidney disease, and I put in my notes also known as K-A-R-M-A, if he did this, Uh which a lot of people think he did. Three years later, he's dead. George Burke Jr.'s son, Wayne Burke, later said his grandmother suffered from depression after the killings and until her death in 1963, often blamed herself for not going with the girls. The popular theory here is that Wayne, either George Sr., who made a pass on the mother Mm -hmm. did this or his son, Wayne Burke and which were both on the search party and then senior helped cover it up or vice versa, the other way around. And I'm going to present some evidence that, that uh, goes along with that theory. Now this is not proven. Okay. But it is quite possible because as you'll see in a second, George Steiny Jr. didn't do this at all. I mean, there's like literally no way he did this. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we just, and I'm going to show you that here in a second. But let's look at the evidence first and then we'll go from there. This isn't the exact bicycle what you're looking at now because there's no picture of what she was riding. But this is a bicycle from the 1940s. This is a, what you're looking at now is the Ward's. Hawthorne skip tooth balloon tire, 26 inch bicycle. Quite the This name. is from the 1940s. The, this is the everyday bicycle. This is the mongoose that you buy at Walmart. This is what like all cruiser. the kids have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, what do you notice about the front wheel? Because when the bodies were found, the front wheel was completely detached. And a lot of people have claimed that it was not only detached, but it was completely bent. And then the front wheel was placed on her body. What they're trying to say is George Steiny Jr. pulled the bike as he was trying to steal it or something and the tire popped off. But if you look at the wheel, it's it's not a quick release wheel. No, it's bracketed in there. That's what I'm saying. This right here is what you're looking at is a quick release skewer. Now, these were invented at the time. And like I said, I don't know what bicycle model she had, but she most likely didn't have one with this in it. This is the thing that are in modern bicycles now. This was invented in the 1927 in Italy for racing. This allows you to pull the pin and take the wheel out. However, the bike that she had most likely did not have one of those. Makes so sense. you can't just pull the wheel out. If the wheel is off, it probably got hit by something like a, a truck, a lumber mill truck, for example. To pull that wheel off will take an extraordinary amount of amount of strength. Or you would need some sort of tool, which I don't see a 14-year-old carrying a wrench around with his sister in the fields, but that's just me. Good okay, point. so do you understand that? Yeah. Now, I'm not saying he couldn't do it, but it's very unlikely that he did do it. And a lot of people claim that the wheel was bent up. So what did he do? Just kick it and bend it and then rip it off like Hulk? No. Most likely... I believe, in my theory, it got hit, or the girl got hit with a truck. And Mm. the bike supports that theory. And I believe it was Benneker, the 11-year-old, because as you read yesterday, the back of her skull was, quote, a mass of crushed bones. Okay, that seems, to me, that fits the theory of a big-ass lumber truck barreling down on you. That's just me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, also... If he was trying to steal the bike, why what would why would you take a bike and get rid of the front wheel? Okay, so I can't prove I can't prove that the bike didn't have a quick release or anything because I've looked it up. I cannot find a bike model anywhere. 
But that is most likely that bike was not pulled off by George Steiny Jr. And most likely the bike was intact before they were murdered. Okay. Mm -hmm. It didn't just fall off because those things were built to last. All right. Let's move on from the bike and go to the bloody clothes that were found in his house. This is from the 2014 trial. And this is Amy talking to the, the council member. Let me ask you a question. You witnessed the police go in? Counselor McKenzie asked. Yes, I did. You witnessed the police go out? Yes. What did they have with them when they came out? Did you see them bring clothing out, for example? Nothing. I did not. Now, if George had had blood on his clothing from the night before, would you have noticed that? Yes, I would have. Go back to the the neighborhood kid that did see clothes being brought out. He never said that there were blood on them. He just heard someone say these are the bloody clothes, but he didn't see any blood on them. We're going to talk about him in a second. If you get attacked in the in the head, the scalp, there's a lot of blood, profusely bleeding. So not only did- you know what's interesting now. I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought, but um, we were talking about a lot of blood yesterday, and it rained. So if something did happen in the road, right? If someone was hit by a car. The rain could have washed it away. Mm. Yeah. Because there was they were found in like a, a shallow puddle. Well, now here's the thing. If it was a car accident, it quickly became something else. Right. Because he may or someone may have hit that one girl, but then. What about the other girl? To d- demolish the other girl. You know, they both had cuts on their face. Now, I'm they could have they could have got ran over and rolled under the, the tire. Or something. And, you know, I don't know. But only their but head have and have br- no marks have anywhere else. Anywhere else, yeah. So hmm. the only way I could see that happening is if he like if the one of the girls is riding on the back spokes of the bike, you know, standing up on the back where the other girl is pedaling or riding on the front on the handle wheels. If they were on the bike and then they get hit and then hit their head and then he thinks that they're dead, so we make sure they're dead. I don't think that's <sighs> what if you happened. Get right, there would but, have to be a- other other injuries yeah you're right now keep in mind i'm not saying that the burke family actually did we can't prove that they did or not right we do we can tell that is not a 14 year old boy a couple things about the clothes no clothes were brought out according to amy the sister who was at the house and the other sister and the brother they all saw their brother getting brought out and there was no clothes from what they saw no clothes were submitted as evidence either which is even, even if they don't have the I mean, we, clothes, they don't have the records. We've done cases in the late 1800s that they would submit that stuff for evidence. They right. still had the clothes from Jack the Ripper's victims. They you know, do? I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, there's well, there's pictures of them at least. I don't know if they have them or not. I'm sure they got them somewhere. I don't know. In a museum, anyway, probably. Here's a question for you. How many sets of clothes do you own, Nicole? A lot. Okay. How many sets of clothes do you think a poor black family that grows their own food and doesn't even own a car and they have to walk to work and church in 1944? How many pairs of clothes do you think George Steiny Jr. owns? Two to three. A handful, yeah. He owns two. One to play and one to go to work and one to go to school. If not only if he would have bloodied all of his clothes... Now he's down to one set. They don't they don't have clothes. Back in the day, you wore the same thing over and over, you know, all the time. So I'm just throwing that out there. All right. So Dr. Peter J. Stevens, a forensic pathologist, testified about the medical exam, and he did this in 2014. And this is what he says. Quote, there is nothing in the external examination report to suggest that defensive wounds of any kind were present. So the absence of such wounds suggests to me that the assailant was a larger assailant with overpowering size and force, end quote. We've done a lot of cases and a lot of victims have defensive wounds, but I think that's a... I don't think that's the correct term. I think they should change the term to defense of defensive wounds because... When you hear defensive wounds, you think someone's fighting back. 
and yes. they're defending themselves. That's not always the case. If you get hit, even if you don't know what's happening, you're just flailing your arms. Yeah, even you're if not, you're trying to block your face or yeah, something. Yeah, you're not actually fighting anyone. Mm-hmm. You're just flailing your arms. So if you got hit in the head with an iron rod or a railroad spike, you're going to automatically flay your arms and there's going to be some sort of scratches or whatever on the the killer or whatever. George didn't have any of the scratches. Not only that, the the victims, the two girls, they didn't have any defensive wounds on their body. Dr. Stevens also says this. Scalp lacerations are classically and characteristically very, very bloody. When there is a laceration, or especially if there is enough laceration to cause fragmentation of the underlying bone, these are going to bleed profusely. But what does that mean? What does what mean? So he's saying like, okay, they're they're, they're going to bleed profusely. So but that there was mean... an absence of blood at the scene. Right. Remember, there's so, an absence of blood. So what does that what does that tell us? If there was an absence of blood, and he's saying this is what we should have seen. Okay, so that's a really good question. Number one, there's there should be blood all over George Steiny Jr. if he killed it. Uh-huh. Number two, there should be blood all over the scene. There wasn't, which means they were moved. Which means the bodies were moved. There was no drag marks that they, were they saw. Carried. There was no brush or anything so they were most likely carried yes so let's say if you hit a girl and even if it's an accident but then you really kill the other one with a lumber truck there's plenty of room back there to throw a couple bodies yeah while you go yeah. and kind of figure out where you're going to put them yeah i what i forgot to mention is the bodies were also found on the property line of the burks Oh, oh yeah, shit. that's another one. I don't know why I didn't mention that. Um, I'm not saying that he did it, but I mean, backing up it's against a, him. It's a compelling. The argument. mother, the mother suffered from intense depression after this. So if your husband or your son, if you're if you're the mother and your husband or son did something like this, even if they didn't say, "Hey, I did this," you know that's your significant other and your baby boy. You know. And the mother is depressed because of this. Something happened. Yep. Even if she wasn't ever told, she knows. That's a mother's instinct right there. And she suffered from depression. A lot of people suffered from depression after this. Well, it's interesting, too, when you think about it, even if she didn't. I mean, even if she's feeling guilt for not going with them, that you can see, you know, you can say, okay, even if Wayne didn't do it, having some sort of guilt over not going with the girls but the fact that he knew where the girls were going if he was home and overheard them saying to mom hey we're going to maypop fields will you come she's like no no i can't and then you know wayne overhears and is like oh well i don't know and then he dies three years later of kidney disease so i mean and and keep in mind guys that This isn't just uh, let's exonerate this guy and everyone's going to be happy because there's family members that showed up at this court who are family members of the Binnaker girl and of Tim's, the seven-year-old. And they were adamant that, yes, George Steiny did do this and he received his justice for doing this. So it's, it's not black and white. There's, and I didn't mean that literally, but it's not... As easy as it seems to just say, ah, he's innocent, throw it out. Because you have two, you have family members that are still alive of two murdered girls. Either way, they were murdered. There's no justice for them. And the only justice they hold on to is the fact that someone was killed for this crime. And they do believe it was him. It's important. There's there's not just one victim yeah. in this story. There's no, three. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's I agree. three, yeah. Okay. Dr. Stevens goes on and says, quote, it would have been unusual to say the least if there had been no sign of blood anywhere on the clothing of the assailant wielding a hammer or any other weapon short of like an eight foot pole, end quote. So, yeah, there would be no blood on George Steiny Jr. if he killed the girls with an eight foot pole. But if not, he would have blood all over him. So talk about George Steiny Jr. walking back. Even if Amy ran in front of him, the sister ran in front of him to uh, water the 
fill up the cow bucket so she can drink water. He kills him, and then he walks back in completely bloody. That would be what it would look like if he would have did it. Does that make sense? I I have a question. Where did the Steinies live compared to where the Burks lived? Did they li- were they neighbors? No, they weren't neighbors. They lived in the black community, but they were about from the church where the bodies were found. I think they were about um I think I remember I want to say like 3 blocks or 4 blocks something like that. It was relatively close from the church. They would walk. I think it was a mile from the church or something like that. And all of this had to happen in a half, they, they half walk, hour period. Yeah, they walk from the their house to go to church. Okay. They don't have a car or anything. Going back to the scalp lacerations, uh, one more thing. The reason you wear a hat on a cold day is because you have all them vessels up there. And you wear a hat because that keeps you warm up there. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of blood that comes out from there. And he said it would, quote, almost be inconceivable for him to have no blood on his clothes. So the sisters would have saw the blood. Right. Now, let's talk about the trial, and let's see if the trial was any fair. His first trial. His he only, only trial. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah his no only appeal. trial. Got it, sorry. The, the only trial that, that lasted, I believe, two hours, not even that. The trial was two hours? Yeah. It was, it was before... That's like traffic court. They they yeah, picked no the shit. they picked the jurors and it was like two thirty p.m. when they picked the jurors and they were out by supper time. So now the inquest was held on March 29th, nineteen forty four, and guess who was there? The Burks. There was no representation of George Steiny Jr. and he was not there in in the presence. The sheriff was the only witness, the only witness that brought any evidence. And this is the evidence here, if you want to read this, because this is the evidence. I was told that Steiny killed those girls, and I was sent to arrest him. Huh, who told you that? Okay, that was was the evidence used to convict this this kid. At 2.30 p.m. on April 24th, 1944, the official trial begins. Twelve white men were the jurors, and I believe that was the time period back then. Uh, blacks were not allowed in attendance. The only evidence was the sheriff's testimony, which read, quote, I was told that Steiny killed those girls and I was sent to arrest him, end quote. It took the jury a full 10 minutes to decide that he would be electrocuted on June 16th, 1944. There was no written confession. There was no murder weapon presented. The state appointed a 31-year-old tax attorney as his defense lawyer. His name was Charles Plowden. He believed that even after the fact that there was no reason even to order George Steiny Jr. a psych evaluation. In fact, he only spent the afternoon with the boy. And if you get sent to death row or whatever, you know, your lawyer is going to have constant communication, not only you and your family. There was none of that with this guy. Can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat what date the trial was? The trial was April 24th, 1944. So literally a month later. A month and a half, yeah. Yeah, 83 days later he was electrocuted. Right, but a month later after the event happened, you're telling me that they did not save the murder weapon for an upcoming trial for 30 days? No, they didn't have it. Well, they, they don't know what the murder weapon is. In the, I thought they said that he showed him the iron post that they pulled out of the puddle. Where is it? I thought they pulled. That's what I'm saying. You, you're they you're they going off the testimony they didn't of the take sheriff. Take it into evidence. That's the, what I'm saying. Like I well, know. I, the sheriff said, "Yeah, I he agree. showed me the murder weapon is an iron pole." A lot of people think it was like a railroad tie. It wasn't even an iron thing. But the, there was but, no weapon. Is what I'm trying to say. There's I know nothing, that. Okay. I I know, and I'm just I'm just the sheriff was lying. Well, okay, yes, gotcha. I know that. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I'm trying to. He I, was definitely lying. His defense attorney, Charles Plowden, did not cross examine any of the state's witnesses. In fact, he was what trying to be a politician. And if you're a politician in the in the Jim Crow era, you ain't going to get very far if you're representing a. a you know what I'm saying. The family was not allowed to visit. Or, I, I put the family was not allowed to visit or attend the trial. The family was not even allowed in the town anymore. <laughs> the family was kicked out of the town. 
Okay. Much and, less going to trial. Are you kidding me? You'd think that they would want to question the family if they after he came home and they would want some sort of testimony. They didn't do shit. Well, here's the thing. Like, and, and I agree with the family. There's literally nothing we can do for him. Yeah, he's our son. But if we go back there, we're going to get lynched. You know, it's like, well, we lost one. I mean, you're hopeless at that point. You can't. You can't go and say anything. You can't even attend the trial. But I'm saying, I know, and <laughs> I know like that crazy. this is a different time period, but yeah. you think that they would give them some sort of protection, you know, to make sure that they could get story from from both sides. That would be, that would be fair. That would be equitable to have both yeah. sides. And which is why we're looking at this in, in the lens of history and not hate, because obviously people aren't like that today. Well, a lot of people aren't like that. Most people aren't like that, at least. Anyway, um, not only that, the sister was with them all day. They never asked her for any testimony or anything. Not at all. One local by the name of Roston Stukes said about George Steiny Jr., quote, he looked more like he was scared to death. The boy looked like he was in a dazed condition. That, that's what you said the other day, dazed. Yeah, he, like, yeah. didn't, uh, like, it didn't look like he was registered in his yeah. mugshot photo. He seemed like he didn't really realize the seriousness yeah. of the crime that he'd committed, end quote. Hmm. Plowden, Probably the, just had no idea why the fuck he was there. Yeah. The, well, he kept saying... He told his mom and he told his cellmate and he went on record as much as he could. He he not only did he say I didn't do it. He said, quote, why are they trying to put me to death for something I didn't do? So he was going through the almost asking, like, why are they doing this to me? It was not like I didn't do it. It was more like, why are they doing this to me? What did, you know, kind of thing. His attorney plowed and never followed up with him or his client after the trial. That I mean, it was like he didn't even, oh, yep, yep that was good. It was a long day. Now I can go home and forget about it completely. Mm. If you want to read this. And, and this is from the book Triple Tragedy in Alcula. Had Plowden filed a one-sentence notice of appeal, the execution would have been automatically stayed until it could be appealed to the Supreme Court. Since he did not, Steiny was then left without legal representations. So it's pretty tragic. So obviously he didn't do it. Number one. And then what I'm also going to, not going to talk about because I don't want it to be too long is there was an expert for false confessions that came in and she made some really good points like how a kid uh, 14 is impressionable and especially at the time like, let's say if you get stopped by a cop, you're automatically going to give that cop some sort of respect subconsciously. So going back to the time, if you're an African-American male, you're automatically going to give any white person, and I'm not saying this to be racist or anything, but you're going to give that white person an, a respect that you don't know you're doing. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. Because so you're really compliant for what they say, especially as an adult, a sheriff. Nonetheless, well, if you're not compliant, something worse could happen to yeah, you. That's a very yeah, I know, but I'm saying, and the confession is obviously false. He, it, it didn't even make sense. The the murder weapon is what they called fluid. It went from seven different things: an iron spike, a i, excuse me, a railroad spike, a railroad drift pin, an iron rod. I mean, what is it? Where is it? <laughs> like a hammer. Like what the fuck is it? <laughs> you know, and what? And, and you're you're saying that number one, George Steiny Jr. is carrying that with him. He's carrying a hammer with him. There's not railroad spikes laying across the ground everywhere. You can't just pull one of them things off the track. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're not just available. To me, out of all the pieces of the story, that was the thing that was most consistent was the spike or the railroad. Whatever. Oh, it was not consistent. No, I know, but it was more consistent than anything else mm -hmm. in the case. <laughs> you know? Except for the who the victims were. Yeah. Now he's finally got a proper burial, but as I said in earlier in the episode, mm -hmm. they initially buried him in an unmarked grave at Calvary Baptist Church because they actually feared the KKK would dig him up, and they're pretty probably accurate on that point. All right, so this is from the New York Times, if you want to read this. South Carolina judge vacates the conviction of George Steiny in 1944 execution. Oh, good. 
Calling it a great and fundamental injustice, a South Carolina judge on Wednesday vacated the 1944 murder conviction of 14-year-old George Steiny Jr., the youngest person executed in the United States in the last century. Judge Carmen T. Mullen of the Circuit Court did not rule that the conviction of Mr. Steiny for the murder of two white girls in the town of Okulu was wrong on the merits. She did find, however, that the prosecution had failed in numerous ways to safeguard the constitutional rights of Mr. Steiny, who was black, from the time he was taken into custody until his death by electrocution. I think she did a good job. That's her right there. Yeah, props to how she handled it. Because, number one, she didn't say that he's innocent. Right. Because, and if you read her 30-page, whatever, disposition on it, which I'll put on talkmore.com, she put a lot of time in it and she couldn't under any good conscience say that he's innocent simply because there's not enough evidence. Right. Unfortunately. There, and there's no evidence to point to who the killer was. But we can definitely say without a doubt that he was not given due process at all. He was literally railroaded. Yeah. And the and basically the court system and South Carolina failed him. And we do look on shame of that, like that one letter said from that Sunday school yep. teacher, because it is shame. It's embarrassing. For me, it's embarrassing. I, I live, like I grew up 30 minutes from this spot. Do you, do you remember <laughs> hearing about this case when you were younger? Or I mean, because um, the, the conviction was not until fairly recently, so maybe it we was hear not all so talked kind, about. There's all, I, mean, I mean, look, we got Dylan Roof yeah. down here. I mean, if you want to come to a place where there's still racism, it's it's here, man. You know. Well, unfortunately, it's all over the country. <sighs> yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, man. I don't know. I wish everyone was blind, so no one would see color. I don't know. Anyway, this is his burial, but I I don't want to say that he's the victim, the only victim that is, because there are two more victims, and I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that. Yeah. Because the, their family still believe that he did it. So it is still an injustice. There's three, no matter what, and we don't know what happened. Maybe the Burke guy ran him over by accident. Maybe he wasn't involved at all. Maybe yeah. he wasn't involved at all. Maybe it was something completely different. Who knows, man? And no one knows what happened, but we do know this case would get thrown out because it's not without a reasonable doubt. I mean, there's plenty of reasonable doubt in this case. Right. Going from everything, you know, this case would never even make it to court. Sure hope not. If if it was today. But anyway, so there are three victims of this case. And like the book said, Triple Tragedy in Alcolu. Check that book out. It's really good if you want to know more about this case. But I think the family is happy as far as the Steiny family. I mean, I, I wish... As happy as I can be. Right. I think they wanted the judge to say, okay, my brother was innocent of the crime. Right. But unfortunately, I don't think she could do that in good conscience simply because the only real evidence that was brought forward was the sister's testimony. And there are other family members that think otherwise. And we read some of those. Mm -hmm. But what we do know for certain is that three children died in south carolina and no matter what happened it was a tragedy yeah for sure and i think now that after the exoneration no matter what your stance is on on everything i think south carolina at least went back and recognized okay this is this was bad this was not a a good point in our history and we have currently tried our best not to rewrite history but to put a little edit in there and say we screwed up this is what we did wrong. Let's not do this again. Right. Type of thing. Yeah. That's what I'd like. At least me, I'd like to think that because I live here, man. I don't want to think we li- You know, I live in a racist state, but you know. Anyway, that's the story of George Steiny Jr. Any questions? No, I think you did a great job covering it. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Yeah, it's a good case. Also, if you um, we're about to record something that's been in my heart for so long now, and we're about to see where Uncle Fatty is. So if you would like to hear that, it'll be on the Patreon. Go to talkmurder.com slash join and be our supporters, and you can hear the whereabouts of Uncle Fatty 
And it's going to make me cry. I literally cried when I was researching Oh, my God. He's getting so upset. I was hoping this one was going to be more uplifting. And then I looked at it. I was like, no, this one, this may tip us over. I may need another drink. This is the saddest case I have ever done. Uncle Fatty? Uncle Fatty. Oh, my God. (laughs) I don't know. It's hard to top after the one we just covered. Yeah, but I have a propensity for uh, animals, you know, like... uh, Yeah. Anyway. He's getting all choked up. So, if uh, you like this story and you think I did a pretty decent job covering the George Steiny Jr. case, uh, go to talkmore.com, leave me a comment. I read all those on the post, the George Steiny post, and also go to YouTube where you stream this live for you guys and become our new tacos or taco nachos or ta- small tacos and supremos talkmore.com slash join my name is john here with jen and a call until night until next time good night you lovely lovely people <laughs>